Maybe let me go to the other building. Maybe something like that. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, I think we'll go that side. Sure, it's on that then. Maybe on that, yeah, we'll go to the other side. Okay, just start a look. Yeah. Okay, I am right. Okay, so the start on that, but maybe on the other Yeah, sure. Other yeah. Side. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're ready. Okay. So first of all, if you could give me your, your name and your title. My name is Nils Harry. I'm 66 years old. I have served as associate professor at the chemistry department of University of Copenhagen for 40, 42 years. And uh, I have just retired recently on September 1st. And But I still have my office and some students left and my research is still running. So on screen you would be Associate Professor of Chemistry at Copenhagen Emeritus. 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 Emeritus Professor. Emeritus Associate Professor I Emeritus. Know. Right, right. Okay, there's a limit to what we can put a bit in, but yeah, you are Associate yeah, Emeritus. I'm retired, yeah. it doesn't matter. I okay. still have my office. I I'm see. Still there. Yeah, okay. Um, and your specialism while you were, when you were there, what was? Well, I'm, this is photochemistry. Chemistry and with light. Chemical processes induced by light and physical consequences of light absorption, which is kind of abstract eventually, but photosynthesis is an example of, of a photochemical reaction. Mm -hmm. So tell me, I mean, just doing general questions first, okay. as I mentioned yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you think happened on 9 11? I don't know. The point is that we're dealing with the the killing of 3,000 people, and it has never been investigated as a crime. There's never been a forensic investigation of that day. And whatever happened, we have to wait for that. But there are hundreds of circumstances and observations. Niels, Niels, which, yeah. Niels can you not tap your phone? Yeah, the tapping will be picked up on the mic. I beg your pardon, but it will pick it up. Thank you. Do, I mean, just uh, let me ask that question again. Do, what, what do you think happened on 9-11? I don't Do you agree with the official official account? No, I don't. The official account is that America was attacked by 19 young hijackers uh, guided by Osama bin Laden. And uh, for once, we haven't seen one single forensic proof for this conspiracy theory to be correct. Not one bit of proof? Not one bit of forensic proof. But I thought there's actually quite a lot of facts out there. Well. Why haven't we heard about them? I haven't. But I have heard about and seen and been involved in the production of hundreds of observations and facts and circumstances which violates the official conspiracy theory. And that's why we are waiting for a criminal investigation of the crime. And until this occurs, we should stay open for whatever it will lead us. So you don't believe, what do you think happened to the Twin Towers? Would you, how do you, why they do you were, think they, they were the, the three high rises, you know, there were two airliners, but there were three skyscrapers and all three of them unambitiously were taken down in controlled demolitions. Controlled demolition? Meaning that you take down the building by the application of incendiaries and explosives. And is there evidence that explosives and incendiaries were used? Plenty. Yeah. In abundance. And who would want to plant those? Oh, this is... We, I don't know. I'm, I'm not talking about people or politics. I'm talking about facts and observations, physics and chemistry. But it could, well, it could be the builders put it in when they, when they built it? Why, why, if, if in case, why, why don't the government tell us that? Mm -hmm. They could just tell us it. And if you believe this, this happened in the 1950s for the towers, okay, why don't they tell us? But why, why would anyone want, I can't see why anyone would want to plant a, a bomb in a building to kill American citizens. Why would Neither they? do I. I mean, this is beyond my realm of expertise. It seems as some people might say absurd. Well, some people. 
But I'm <laughs> some people have difficulties with see what they actually see. And what you should do, if you have problems, is just to watch. There were three high rises, but there were only two airliners. Now you don't have to have a PhD in physics to count the three, okay? So what happened to building seven? Which was roughly a little less than half the height of the Twin Towers. It collapsed on its own seven hours after the North Tower. And the way it came down unambitiously indicates that it was a controlled demolition. There is no way a steel-framed high-riser can come down due to fire. And it's very easy to understand because over history there's been many fires in steel-framed high-rises. And each time you're doing an experiment. And this is what we scientists, we love experiments. Each fire in a steel frame high riser was an experiment. And you make an observation when the fire is over, the building is still there. This even happened in the, in the Twin Towers and many other high rises. Each time you're drawing the conclusion, the building did not come down. The experiment is being repeated many, many times. And in science, when you have written repeated the experiment over and over again, you come to a conclusion, and the conclusion is that a steel-framed high riser does not collapse due to fire. And that's it. We could stop here, basically, and the rest of it is uh, extra, is what we call supplementary information. Because just from these basic observations, you can conclude that a steel-framed high riser does not collapse due to fire. And that's it. Because it looks like a controlled demolition. Listen, you didn't understand that we have made the experiment with the high rises and they do not come down due to fire. Well, that is one thing. Has there ever been a partial collapse of a high, a high rise steel frame building? A partial collapse? Has there ever been one? Yes, you know? and particularly what you call composite buildings where you both have concrete and steel frame. Then you, then the concrete. Which collapses. bit collapses? Which, um, which bit collapses then? Does the steel frame actually collapse? It depends on with. But it does, I can tell you it does, because I think there have been clear examples where the steel frame building has collapsed. That's not true. Um, I'm sorry, it's not true. If you want to bring out an example, it is probably what we call composite buildings. What are your examples? No, there are, there are, there are, there are not, there are low rises where low rise steel frame have collapsed. There are high rise where the concrete center has stayed in, intact, but the, the steel frame outer has, has collapsed around it. Now we're going into details. Well, details are important. Are facts you are aiming, important yeah, to you? But you are aiming, in this case, you are probably aiming at the Windsor Tower in Madrid. But then that. That's uh, one example where you can see yeah. exactly that. But the point there is, um, you are taking us into details. But the point there is that the upper 16 floors of the, of the Windsor Tower, there the floors were concrete and they went down and leaving alone the front, the steel front, completely unsupported. And that is not a steel frame, my friend. This is a composite building. You are not, I'm, I'm calling for an example of a genuine steel frame building which had collapsed due to fire. Mm -hmm. Please. Well, and they, they, they are, there are other examples where, where I haven't got all the, the names listed, but I, I can, I can come back to you with that, with, with, with other buildings I where they are. I appreciate that. Because the various, various in, international groups that look at the engineering have, have not high rise. I, I, I accept that. Well, there haven't been high rise. Of course. But there have been other, the basic principle that's operating there, which is that when steel is heated beyond about 600 degrees centigrade, it loses about half its strength. Yeah. which is basic physics and science, which you like. But and when that happens, the building loses some of its stability. Yeah. If left, that can cause the building to collapse. It, but it doesn't. And it, it does in, in some low rises, it has. And in most high rises where it's happened, it's, there have been rare number, very few fires in high rises. Uh, the longest one where it's been, un, when it wasn't had, didn't have a fire service treating the fire, uh, WTC7, where it's burned for seven hours and wasn't treated by the fire service, that did collapse. Not due to the fires. 
Well, that's your argument, but, but, it, but equally, to... be, equally, NIST had looked at it for, for, for many years and suggested that it did. Look, it came down, building seven, take an example. But I want to dispute what you just said about, about uh, high rises collapsing due to fires. You, when you, for, for once, two points here. When you, of course, when you have a steel roof, of course it comes down. But British steel, which is uh, respected, or was, it's not called British steel anymore, but they take actually the series of experiments. Cutting scale, experiments. Exactly, the cutting some experiments. Mm -hmm. Over seven years, over eight years, they made seven controlled experiments where they built eight-story full-scale steel mm -hmm. frames and burned them under completely controlled demolitions, meaning that you could actually recall, recall temperatures yeah. within the steel. In the worst case scenario, they had temperatures of 1100 degrees. How long did they have them for? 11 hours. 1100, please wait, 1100 degrees yeah. centigrade within the steel. At that point, steel is spaghetti, boiled spaghetti, but the building remains standing. And how long did they have those temperatures for? Hours. But no, this is important. How, how long do you know how long had they had them at that temperature for? I, we can go and look up the... I, I would suggest you do have a look at that at some point because yeah. that is an example where the fact that actually is very important because I did go to the, the, the building research in, in, institute that, that carried that out, mm -hmm. spoke to the engineer who carried that out. Yeah. And if you look at the, those papers in detail, you'll see how long they, they were held at that temperature for. Let me finish the point. Yeah. Let me finish the point because it's quite important because it's a fact. Yeah. Because when you're, when you're looking at an experiment like that, it isn't just a matter of the temperature it reaches, it's how long it's held at that temperature for. It goes the other way. And I think way. you'll find it's more than just a couple of It rounds. goes the other way round. It is you who have to produce an example of a steel-framed high-riser ever having collapsed mm. due to fire. Mm. And you cannot. Mm. And the Star Tower stood for 56 minutes. Mm. Come on. Mm -hmm. There has been no reported example of steel framed high rises collapsing due to fire, and it was not building seven. The process so is clear. The the example of a high rise is is right. There hasn't been until WG seven. There is no okay. high rise steel frame building having okay. collapsed. So let's However, the process is clear. The example you give in the carding experiments is wrong because you you incorrectly state the number of hours that it was held at that temperature. No. Nope. And if you have a look at it, you'll find that it didn't have a, that temperature for very long. It didn't um, collapse, okay. The Carlington fire. That's it because you need to look at how long it was held at that temperature. Okay. You have to produce an example of a steel frame which collapsed due to fire, and you cannot. And that is the bottom line, because it is not me who has to present the steel frame which has the So same do you thing. honestly believe that if you held a steel frame building and you have steel and you have temperatures that are over seven six hundred degrees on whole floors that you then if you maintain that temperature for, for say seven hours that the building will will be intact. <laughs> do, do you really believe that? Well it happened. You would you be happy to stay in a building at the top of that, say a fifty floor building? With in a standard steel frame building yourself, and then would you would you not take the, the stairs and exit? Of course I would. You would stay in it because you would no, know no, no, it's no, so no. safe. No, 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 no. Please, when you are saying that the first building ever to collapse due to fire, a steel frame, was building seven. Okay, that's what you said, mm -hmm. and you're claiming that. It's not me, it's, it's, what, it's what others have, have claimed. I mean, it's what NIST have claimed, it's what, it's what said, authorities just, have. You just said that Building 7 came down, okay? And you're talking about roaring fires. It is not true. It was minor, random, small fires. And that, but it is not personal. That was that based on? But that, that suggestion, no, small fires. You should look at the pictures. I have looked at the pictures. Very good. Then we must agree that they were small, random fires. I don't agree with that, no. Okay. But it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because that's fairly important as to how big the fires were and how because widespread. You base the uh, you you base that suggestion of, of the fires being small and uh, not over over many uh, many floors on on looking at a few some pictures. Yeah, that's your scientific analysis based on a few yeah, pictures. I'm looking at pictures. 
Of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. no, I'm looking at all the, uh, the available pictures. I have read the NIST report. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm expressing the conclusion of NIST. And these are small, random fires. But it is not important because the way the building comes down tells all. What the look you, of it. And the rate, the acceleration. The building is coming down in free fall. This is a number one observation. For Almost free fall. No. Nope. Actually. Well, no, 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 no. It is straight free fall for almost 2.5 seconds. Almost. Yeah, exactly. Almost. And no, then, no, no, and then, no, And then it isn't at free fall. It is free fall. Yeah. It is, and it, well, it, you, you, you say it for the right yourself when you say it's almost free fall for, no, no, for no. about three seconds. That's, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Yeah. I did not say that. Well, just to use the word almost. No, no. Way. For almost 2.5 seconds. Yes. It was within free fall. I see. Fall. Okay, I understand. You're it was that. within free fall. Yeah. For, all, for, say, a little more than two seconds. Okay? And it was completely free fall. It was at okay, within well, 1% yeah, yeah. of free fall okay, on Manhattan. So, I see, so it's, it's not quite, yeah. And this yeah. is the completely unambitious proof that you had controlled demolition. Because at that time, when the whole building symmetrically goes from complete rest directly into free fall, at that moment, all the supporting structure must have been eliminated. And the last part of, at least the last part of the supporting structure must have been eliminated by explosives. Otherwise, you cannot see a complete symmetrical gun going down in free fall. Now, we are talking basic physics here. We are talking about Sir Isaac Newton, your countryman, professor of Cambridge, whose tomb is in Westminster Abbey. And for good reasons, because he wrote a book in 1687 which we call Principia, which is the basic book of science in the world as we live in here, or in the physical world we live in here. And what we are talking about here is his fundamental laws and the implication of that. Newton has been right for 350 years. He has never lost a game. So the conclusion based on this observation is that the building was brought down by explosives. And the official report by NIST suggests that there was an internal collapse of many floors before that, so which allowed it to collapse in the, in the way it did. You've read the report, that's what it, it talks about, an internal collapse, isn't it? But it doesn't, doesn't make any you difference. You discount that? No, no, because... You think they made it up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. I think that the NIST report is scientifically so flawed that I would call it a fraud. It's a scientific fraud. It's a conscious cover-up. So the, no doubt. You're accusing the people who worked on it, Dr. Shyam Sunder and the other people who worked on it, of, of being fraudulent. Uh, of, being, of being deliberately covering up what actually yeah, happened. Yeah. Quite frankly. It's quite a serious allegation, isn't it? It is. And what, do, what evidence do you think they deliberately covered up? Oh, that is a long, long story. And we have, the, no, I'm not at all in this. There are 1,500 architects and, arch and architects and engineers behind this claim. Richard Gage, you know this organization. And the, I consider it scientific mainstream that Building 7 came down in a controlled demolition. And you can go through the NIST report page by page, and you can see how they're suppressing, twisting, making deliberate and undeliberate errors, downright errors. Mm -hmm. And it is, and, and of course, we have, I'm, I'm not alone, well, there are thousands of scientists behind this. And uh, we have pointed on all the faults. It's all, it is not, of course, in the mainstream media. You find this information on the web because the mainstream media do not want to report this. For some reason or another, you should be better to answer that. But it's, uh, yeah, I stand behind my accusation, yes, absolutely. And uh, tell me about, just, just going through some more general points in there, uh, let me just uh, talk about, you talked about the architects and engineers 9-11 truth. What do you think has happened to the uh, 
those who've questioned the official account. How, how, do you, how would you characterise how that movement has changed over the last 10 years? The movement has changed. It's been growing. It's growing every day. The hundreds of people are, are seeing on their own. Each one is acting on their own. Nobody's telling anyone to act. Each one is acting out from an inner voice, telling me there's something wrong here. If you have seen Building 7, there's no way back. You can try to, you can try to put it away. I haven't seen it, but it's always there. And Building 7 is coming down in free form. Obviously, controlled demolition. So you can try to cheat on yourself or you can speak up and live with dignity. And when did you, what made you, what convinced you that the official account was? I saw Building 7, it's four years ago. And I had two problems immediately. One thing is that up until that point, I thought that the World Trade Center were the Twin Towers. Like everybody else, I, most people actually in the world. And uh, I was told that this was, this was World Trade Center. And what I saw was a gigantic skyscraper. From Danish standards, it's three times taller than any building we have around here. Coming down. And why should this be World Trade Center? Why have nobody told me about this before? I, this goes to BBC. And uh, the other thing was that I, as, as a natural scientist, I'm trained to try to understand whatever goes on around me. This is my instinct, always trying to understand what's going on. And I couldn't understand why this building standing there. The last seconds there are even, not even small fires. There are no smoke, there's no nothing. You just see the building going down and you can actually see the explosions are running from the bottom up on the north side. You just watch. But at that time I didn't understand. I just, I just hate what's going on. So I had to look into it. This is the bend of my nature. And after a couple of weeks, I understood that this is the most important event in my lifetime. And from that moment on, there's been no way back. And do you feel sort of driven by this? I'm driven by two things. First, I'm opposed to crime. And we are talking about the killing of 3,000 people and it has never been investigated as a crime. That we have no, we have been presented for no evidence. There's been no grand jury and uh, nobody has been wanted for the terror attack. Osama bin Laden has never been wanted for it due to the lack of evidence. That's one thing, I'm opposed to crime. Next, I have six grandchildren. And in a couple of years, they'll be old enough to ask me, Grandfather, which side were you on? And I'm going to answer them, I was on your side. So do you believe that there were 19 hijackers? Do, do you accept the official account that there were 19 hijackers and they did take, hijack four airplanes? <laughs> there is no evidence. There is no evidence that these 19 hijackers ever got on these planes. There are no tickets, they're not on the original manifestos. There are no boarding passes. There are no ground hosts telling them they're boarding. There are no videos of them going through security. The one you might refer to is from Portland. There is no evidence that they would be able to take over four airliners at the same time within a half an hour or something and, and prevent eight adult, trained, seasoned pilots from just pushing the hijack button. There is no evidence how these young men who had never flown an airliner before could hit the Twin Towers. It is like threading a needle on a horseback at 900 kilometers or 60 kilometers an hour. There is no evidence explaining why the American Air Force remained on the ground for one and a half hour. Under ordinary circumstances, they would be up and intercepting within 10 minutes. And they stood still for one and a half hour. There is no evidence explaining why an airline, a Flight 77, after having flown around in the most supervised 
airspace on the Earth were able to slam into the most strongest surveyed and protected and defended building in the world, the Pentagon. And it was flown by a pilot who couldn't even rent a Cessna. He was not allowed to rent. And it is doing a completely crazy maneuver in the last step, making it 270 degrees turning and diving at the same time. And you want me to believe that? If this was the script of an action movie, wouldn't you run to the ticket office screaming and ask for your money back? So, do you think that civilian airplanes did crash into those buildings? Do I believe that... C civilian airplanes, the American Airlines, oh, United States Airlines? Oh, sure, of course, there were two airliners. Who Some people don't believe that. Obviously, they do. <laughs> of course, there were two airliners crashing into the towers. And the one into the Pentagon and one in the crash to Chester. Pentagon, uh, we, we are still missing the, the evidence for that. I, but this, there's a lot of discussion about what happened at the Pentagon, and I did not touch that. I don't know. We're still waiting for all the camera, all the camera footage which Pentagon confiscated immediately. We're waiting to see that. And if, and if the government will release these videos, I think it will help a lot. For instance, and we haven't seen the wreckage. But at the moment, you don't, you're not convinced that there was even a plane, an air, a civilian airplane, American Airlines 77. You don't think that necessarily hit the Pentagon. I'm a scientist, and all my statements and convictions are based on positive evidence. And what I'm saying, we have to wait for the positive evidence. I'm saying that there is, up until now, there has, there is no evidence for that, and that's where I start. I'm waiting for positive evidence. So if I gave you evidence, would you be convinced by Of that? course, the one would. Okay, well, I spoke to the, the special agent who was in charge of, of gathering evidence from the FBI, who was in charge of gathering evidence from the scene afterwards. She picked up parts of the plane. She picked up, some had distinctive lettering from the, from the American Airlines plane. She picked up body parts. She picked up uniforms, bits of uniforms. Why haven't they displayed it? What the body what parts? Been... Body parts of some oh, no. people. Taste But okay, well, I, the, the FBI has shown me, and I have film of it of a, of a section of the fuselage from American Airlines 77. I'll put it up for public okay. dis discussion. Would that convince you? That depends. Of course, I have to see it. I'm, uh, you know, of course. But uh, uh, the official story which you must agree upon, is what I just told. It's in the 9-11 Commission report, right? Okay. And that's what I relate to. I'm, you asked me in the beginning uh, about evidence pro the official conspiracy theory, and I said there is none, and I said there is plenty of evidence against it, and all the time I'm talking about positive evidence. Now, the official account so you don't, don't, you exclude what the FBI special agent is saying. Is that not positive evidence? Someone who's actually there. I suggest for if the FBI have evidence, they should present it to the public. Of course. A witness who was there? Is that not evidence? No, I... Um, we don't I, trust someone. Is that basically what it comes no, down to? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, 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 a natural scientist. My convictions are based on hard evidence. You can buy any opinion out. So a witness who actually sees things, witnesses things, that, that, that doesn't, doesn't count for anything? Of course. It does count in a court of law. Yeah. Yes. But take a woman like April Gallup who actually walked out the hole with her baby after the event at Pentagon. But, and, and she didn't see any wreckage. Uh, for, and that's witnesses. And there, there are many other witnesses opposing that there was an airline. But please, we are into territory now where there is contradicting witnesses. And I say, my, I base everything I'm saying here as hard evidence. And you're dragging me into a situation where there is no hard evidence. Well, I've seen and I've, I've, I've spoken to witnesses um, and I've seen things myself, which is very hard evidence. I've spoken to a structural engineer who was there at the scene, you know, I don't think you were there. Um, 
that's pretty clear evidence from somebody who's there. And I think to, to discount someone who's actually there as a witness is... It's secondary evidence. You've spoken to somebody who has seen the evidence. Show me the evidence. That's yeah. what I want. Yeah. Yeah, every, yeah. Everybody should want that. Well, a court of law wouldn't work on that basis, would it? A court of law wouldn't work on the basis that we would both... discount a witness who is actually there. But can we agree? Wouldn't. Very good. I wouldn't agree on that note because no, no. a court of law works on the basis as how all courts of law in the, across the world are. A witness is fairly essential to it. Great. If you just get to all witnesses, then of course you're not going to see any evidence. Are you? Great. Yeah. You want the court of law. Mm. So do I. Mm. So let's set the court of law and bring in the witnesses. Can we agree on that? Well, it's not for me to decide what. You know, so I, 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 I go and ask people and ask the questions. And, and, and uh, when people are happy to talk to me, then I'm delighted to talk to them. But I, what I find strange is that you are not willing to accept the, the word of someone who's a, a clear witness to something. You were referring to the court of law, and we can agree on that. So let us set up the grand jury, bring in the witnesses, and take it from there. Mm. Yeah, but it, 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 the point I'm asking is, what, why can't you accept that a witness who's there, an eyewitness, why don't you accept an eyewitness just because they're an official? What are we talking about now? Well, they're like the, the FBI special agent who was on the scene. Well, the FBI special agent... Gathering, gathering bits of play, gathering bits of body parts, gathering bits of, of uniform from, from people who have been blown up from their life. That's pretty tragic. That's, that's pretty vital and real. And you just to dismiss that as though that doesn't count strikes me as rather flippant with, with facts. The FBI agent has seen this. I have. Yes, but what I'm asking you is why shouldn't you therefore listen to that FBI agent and okay. take, take note of it and change your views because of that? Because I want this FBI agent to come into the courtroom and present his evidence in front of the judges. And I'm not taking any stand on this. But why, sh why should she come into a court? She hasn't. Why what? should I take a stand on this? Because she should come into the court because what I'm talking about is, is, a, is, a, is a court with what you call supreme power. So the court should ask the FBI agent to come in and present her evidence. And I'm, this is I'm, all I'm asking for and this is what I'm waiting for. I'm not taking a stand of you as the second reference of some FBI agent who said something and you want me to relate to that. Isn't this a bit far off? Not really. I mean, she, she said it on camera. She, she's a eyewitness to it at the time. Um, how, how good do you want someone who's actually there? I want... Holding body parts, holding uniforms, holding bits of airplane. I mean, oh, I don't know... Take it off, Mike. Okay, it's done. Just change that. Change that. Hold it. Hold it, hold it. Yeah, we're not going to be taking pins in our hands. You're derailing. Sorry? You're running off the road. Why do you think I'm running off rails? You don't? I mean, it's, it's, it, the Pentagon is a fairly important area to, to ask questions about, isn't it? I mean, you... you actually, it is, it is, actually, it is the important thing, but uh, the government is, uh, is done in scientific circles. So, to run it off track. Why is it least important? No, no, no. I didn't say that. Oh, sorry, well, I didn't tell something you said that. It's, no, no, it's just a sense. Because everyone can see that there's something fishy there. I mean, it's quite obvious. Mm. Well, I didn't see it. I mean, I just I, that, That's... I'd be interested to know what, what, is, what is fishy about it then. I'll ask you that question. Why did it happen? What well, in terms of the how can the most protected building in the world? Mm, don't, don't don't tell me now. Let me say it because I'd like to hear you say it on camera. When we talk about witnesses, it's Barry Jennings. Yeah, 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 Barry Jennings. Yeah, talking about witnesses. Mm -hmm. That's for the bars Okay, yeah, yeah. Twenty seconds. Are you are you bottom up, Julian? Yeah. 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 
I'm going to finish with the drain back. And we'll crack on just a second. Focus. Okay, camera's rolling. So we we're just asking about the Pentagon deals. Um, the, the facts seem fairly clear what happened there. The official account does seem to check out with all the facts that are there. Really? I disagree. And why do you, why do you think there's, it doesn't, I doesn't have, why I do you think the official account doesn't seem to hold true at the Pentagon? Well, I have, I've said this already. I find it unbelievable that a pilot which was not allowed to render a Cessna could fly a, a Boeing 757 and make a 270 degrees turn and a dive at the same time and slam it into the building. It's an impossible maneuver. I don't believe that it should be possible for an airliner to attack the most protected and, and best defended building in the world. And uh, so if the government wants me to believe that, I suggest that they release the more than 80 videos, as I understand, video cameras actually monitoring this building. They, they just relieve the footage of the Boeing and that's it. And until then, I'm just waiting for the hard evidence. So where did the airline go? I, have, I don't know. American 77 disappeared or? Uh, well, please. I'm referring to hard evidence. I'm not doing any speculations. I'm just waiting for the hard evidence. But there were, there were passengers on it. There was an American Airlines 77. There were, did have passengers on it, had pilots on it. Where did it, where, where did it possibly go if it didn't crash into the, into the Pentagon? I'm a physicist and chemist. I specialize in the collapse of the World Trade Center. And all these discussion about the airliners and the passengers, and there's plenty to talk about. I suggest that you take in other specialists who know more about that. We can, we can go on for hours discussing this. And the, and the problem here is that you, there are conflicting evidence out there. Okay. And most of it is conflicting with the official story. That's not what I've found, but well, that's, that's, your, that's your opinion. Yeah. It is, definitely. But until further, I think that it is unbelievable that an airliner should be allowed to fly around for one and a half hour and then slam into down around Ron on office building. I don't believe that this is, was just an accident. I've spoken to an air traffic controller um, and he explained why they failed, and they did fail, it was a failure to, mm -hmm. to, to launch aircraft to intercept. Okay. And the explanation is fairly clear, right. that there was a lack of communication. <laughs> and There's been written books about it, please. Yeah. But you don't. You just don't accept that. You you know the explanation, but it doesn't mean anything to you. But I don't believe that the American people is paying billions of billions of dollars to the most effective air force in the world, and they should fail on such a simple occasion like this. Okay. And you you you've sort of questioned whether there were indeed nineteen hijackers, um, and a few months ago we heard news that. Osama bin Laden being killed. Do you believe that he he was killed by U.S. Navy SEALs then? I believe that Osama bin Laden died more than nine years ago, probably on December the twelfth or thirteenth, two thousand one. Way back then, and and what happened to him after that? He died. <laughs> what? But what did? What, what did, why were the Ameri what were the Americans hunting for after that? They had a big operation to try and hunt for him. The CIA, the FBI involved in a, in a, in a large hunt for, well, for Osama bin Laden. What were they doing? Were they just doing that for a, for a joke? You should, why don't they ask them? I did ask them. Oh, please, yeah. And they right. said, they, they said they were insulted by the suggestion that they would not be doing, they were not working to try and find Osama bin Laden. Well, I, I, they well, say I, it was I, absurd. I apologize if I have in, if I have insulted anyone, anybody. I'm talking about hard evidence from start to end. They so say they had hard evidence when they, when they, when they were there. They had DNA. Um, they had 
they physically ID'd the person and the, his wife at the time shouted out his name. Why don't they show us? And if they showed it, would you be convinced? Yes. Or would you then say, we want a court of law and something else? Of course, it should be, the, of course he should be convicted. He has never been charged. And somebody called the, the FBI way back, a reporter called um, Ed Hart. And he asked the FBI, now why, why, why don't you, why is Osama bin Laden not wanted for 9-11? And uh, the spokesman uh, called Rex Tom answered quite bluntly because FBI does not have any hard evidence connecting Osama bin Laden with the terror attacks on 9-11. And that's it. This is FBI admitting they did, do not have any hard evidence for this. And we haven't seen any hard evidence either. You don't I think haven't. you don't think Al Qaeda was involved in 9/11 at all. When we're going into the political realm now, I think it's I, not the political realm. I think it's sort of it's 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 the official account of what happened. Official no. account of what happened absolutely essentially says that uh, Al Qaeda was responsible for 9/11. Of course not. Yeah, of course. I I have not seen any evidence that the 19 hijackers. Actually, I know an Iceland island an, a, a, a person from Iceland who has put out a reward of 10,000 pounds sterling to anyone who can produce hard evidence for that the 19 hijackers actually boarded these planes and his money is still in the bank. So if you can present hard evidence that the 19 hijackers went on board these planes, you can earn 10,000 pounds sterling like that. I suppose it depends what you call the evidence. So there's, there's video evidence. There's, no. There's, there is video evidence. No. There's, there's evidence with, where the, their names are on the list. There's, it's there's names where, but it depends what you, you see. You don't accept certain things that you, when, other people would call evidence. Um, and then there's, there's, there's the, uh, there's evidence of the things that are being collected from, from, a, from the World Trade Center on the ground. <laughs> and, you, and you, and you don't accept that again, do you? His passport. I, do you accept that? They are finding the passport beneath the towers before the collapse. So you think that the hijacker flying at 960 miles per hour tells his co-pilot a few seconds before impact, I just have to pull out my passport. He's rolling down the window, throwing out the passport, and it is accidentally just found on the sidewalks. Is that the story you accept? So the passport was planted. I, I, you, I asked, I asked you, is this a story you accept, or do you think that the passport survived the blast of the jet fuel and flew out through the flames and landed on the sidewalks? This is what you believe. <laughs> are you serious? Yes. You are. Okay. I think well, that's, that's the official account. Is that not the official account? Well, if you accept the official account there, I, I, we disagree. I beg to differ. But he's, that, so he's, but the point is, is if, if, if evidence is presented to you, and I guess this guy in Iceland, it, 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 you, you decide whether it, you think it's evidence or not. Of course. It? It's like, I, you know, I might go and speak to a witness. You haven't spoken to this any witnesses. From, even with you, witnesses. I don't think you've actually spoken to any witnesses who were there at, at, the, at the, say, the Pentagon. But you, if, if I go and speak to someone, you say, well, they're, they're not, they're not, a, they're not a witness that I accept. We're so talking you, about. You have a different approach to what is a, what is evidence, and you dismiss anything that I suggest to you. Um, you which suggest, seems a strange way of <laughs> operating. You suggest that the passport found from one of the hijackers besides World Trade Center belong to a hijacker who had just flown an airliner at 960 kilometers per hour into a high-rise and he rode down the building and took out the passport and threw it out. This is what you accept? No, I don't accept that. No. You just said that. No, I, accept, I, I accept it was it was found afterwards and it would have been, it's quite possible that it was ejected from the plane. Why? Why not? Why not? Because I just outlined the scenario but <laughs> I, you would flunk any exam, my friend, at uh, even elementary school in physics and chemistry. This is completely beyond imagination. 
And um, you didn't quite answer the question I was asking in terms of Al-Qaeda. You, you don't think that Al-Qaeda was involved in any way in 9-11? I'm expecting question. for evidence, please. We must have an investigation. So at the moment, do you think there's any evidence that Al-Qaeda was involved no. in 9-11? No. And all evidence is against it. Against what, sorry? The, uh, against the 19 hijackers. I'm not talking about Al-Qaeda. I'm talking about the 19 young men who, according to the official conspiracy theory, this was a con conspiracy. Okay, 19 people. Conspiracy, yeah. Conspiracy. Yeah. It was a conspiracy, okay, when 19 people agrees of making a crime. It's a conspiracy thing. And it's a theory. The only occasion, actually, where some evidence was presented, according to NATO, was at a meeting on October the 2nd in Brussels. The story of how NATO got into this war starts on, on September the 12th less than 24 hours after the impact at a meeting in Brussels where uh, the, the North Atlantic Assembly met and uh, agreed upon a statement saying that provided if the attack was directed from abroad, they considered it as an attack on the whole alliance area and they can, the, an Article 5 of the Nature Treaty was activated. Now this, which obviously they had somebody in, yeah. they had a suspect, but there were no proofs yet. This was officially provided by Frank Taylor, who was the title of ambassador, an American employee from the Foreign, Minister of Foreign Affairs, who came to Brussels on October the 2nd and presented the evidence that this attack was directed from a board which should have been like Afghanistan, by Osama bin Laden. The meeting was closed. And the, and the, the minutes from the, the report from the meeting uh, has never been published. It is, it is classified. On October the 4th, Lord Robertson, at that time Secretary General of NATO, came forward and said uh, that we have seen the evidence and we accept that the attack was directed from abroad. And now we consider Article 5 of the NATO Treaty to be in operation. Uh, from, and from that moment on, my country was at war with Afghanistan. But we have, we, the public and the soldiers who are fighting for their lives, have not seen the evidence yet presented by Frank Taylor. And what I suggest is that they show us the evidence. We haven't seen it yet. And that is the story how my country got into Afghanistan. And this is the only political statement I'm ready to put forward here. Denmark has the highest number of casualties in Afghanistan relative to our population. Okay, we're fighting in Helmand. And I think that we owe the soldiers why we're there. And it was originally Operation uh, in 2002, the hunt down for Bin Laden. And the Danes were there already at that time. Okay. Uh, the final general, general point for I want to get onto your particular research just about okay. is, is the, the fourth plane that went down, it went down at Shanksville, crashed at Shanksville. Do you believe that was a, a, a civilian airplane? Or do you believe it crashed into the ground at Shanksville? There was no wreckage. The people who came out actually to look at the wreckage, they, they went home after 20 minutes because there was nobody there. The corona said, well, I'm finished, there's no job for me. They just went home. He said, I think he said, he, he, there, there was, there was, there were parts of, body parts, there was, there was, there was, there were small parts of, of wreckage there. And people did carry on working. The coroner, who we have spoken to before, uh, said there were, you know, there was um, a, a tragic scene there. And there was clear evidence that the plane had crashed. Over seven square kilometers. The wreckage was spread over seven square kilometers. What sort of wreckage was spread over seven kilometers? The airline. Yeah. What? What? So parts of the parts of metal and parts of the engines were found over seven square kilometers, were they? Yeah, spread all over. I'm not very much into flight. I've not seen that. That's not the evidence I've ever seen. Okay. The only evidence I've seen is that small parts of, of 
insulation, things that could be blown in by the wind, were fa found several, a few miles away. I think you should compare with other airline crashes then. The point you're making is that, are you suggesting that something other, than, if it, it didn't crash there at Shanksville? I don't believe that, no. Did it crash where? I don't have no idea. Shot out of the sky? Could be. Taken off to Barbados or something? No. Come on, I'm not speculating. I'm, I'm all the time, I have to repeat it again and again. Show me the evidence. And, with the, and the side you're pointing at regarding Flight 93, there just ain't no wreckage. And that's it. That's where it starts for me. Show me the evidence, the hard evidence. Don't bring uh, uh, rumors about the witnesses. Yeah, but the coroner has to... The person who was there, again, a, a sort of person that you don't accept the coroner, who, uh, an eyewitness who was there. Oh. You did call him uh, to, to your to your, to, to your aid a second ago, but when he, when he seems to say something against you, you, you don't then dismiss him. No, but this is what I recall what the coroner said. But, uh, but uh, So if we are in a dispute about witnesses, I think we should fall back on the hard evidence, because this is all we got. Okay. There are parts and, of the plane found at the and scene. And wait for the grand jury. Yeah. And there are parts of the plane found at the scene. Wonderful. Let's wait for the grand jury. Isn't that hard evidence? Let's wait for the grand jury. Well, you, you see, the point is there may not be any need for a grand jury if the evidence is already there. What? If the evidence is already there. What? You don't think there's evidence, but everyone else does. What? If you have a crime... And would you say that there is no need for an investigation? What crime? Killing of 3,000 people, yeah, even more. By who? I don't know. This is why we need an investigation. Well, because most people accept that there wasn't, the, the cr only crime was committed was by 19 hijackers. Yesterday, a pool was uh, published. There's just been a pool among the New Yorkers. You might not know this. And when the New Yorkers was asked, do you want a new investigation in tonight? 48% voted yes. Did you know that? No, I didn't know. Okay, it came in last night. This is half the population of New York. And you're talking about most people accepting? Accepting the, the official account? Yeah. Yes. But I'm talking about half the population of the New York. And this is... This is hard evidence. This is a poll which has just been published last night, and you don't know. And you think that everybody is accepting. What's the last national poll then you, you can point to? Oh, I'm, this, I'm not a specialist in So I thought you were just asking me whether it's a, you were just questioning whether I should know something happened yesterday. You don't know the last 10 no. years when there was the last national poll of the, U, of the US. I, I don't think that, that you know it cost money. And then nobody has come up with the money to do that. Well, it has been actually, but Maybe. but you don't know about it. Okay, just just you just wanted to make a point, score a point. But uh, there has, and it was a script poll, and it, it found around about just over thirty percent of people thought that, that either the, gov the U.S. government allowed or in some way caused nine eleven to happen. And this is four years ago. This was two thousand and seven. Right. So apparently, the percentage has. Well, it's, uh, I don't know what the, you, you, I haven't seen it, so I don't know what exactly the question is. The question you were suggesting is a different question to the one that Scripps asked, which is a very wide question. Yeah, you it's said a completely that, different question, isn't it? You said that most people accept the official story. Based on what? Based on the Scripps national poll. There is no national poll since then that I'm aware of. If you are, then correct me. I You're talking about a, a poll in New York asking whether there should be an investigation, another investigation, which is a different there's, question. There's an but it's a, it is a question in New York. It's not a national poll of the US, is it? No, of course not. Okay. Just, but it's an example. I don't know. It's just, uh, it seems a strange, way, strange point to make, but if, if you want to, we're, we're okay. clear then. Um, uh, Final uh, sort of general point. So I've spoken to a, a former CIA uh, member who was... Um, Deputy in charge of the Counter Terrorist Centre, Philip Mudd. Um, and he said the idea that the US government was in some way involved in conspiracy is, in his words, beyond imagination. Uh, the facts point in another way. Suggest anything else is, in his words, despicable. Excuse me? Despicable. What does that mean? Just, um, 
it, insulting, I, I think is another His word. words? Yes, his words. He used the word despicable. Just despicable. Well, I mean, he's talking about his own imagination. He's talking about the suggestion that a lot of people have in on that, that you would agree with, who have suggested in some way the CIA or the FBI or the US government in any shape or form has been involved in the conspiracy to kill its own member citizens. Well, he's talking about his... his I I'm, I'm apologise if, if uh, the millions of people who are questioning the official story are insulting anyone, but I can only apologise on my own behalf. But suggesting that, and I think you are suggesting, that they were, had a hand in murdering American citizens. I think it's more of an offensive act that you want me to believe that the hijacker can throw out his passport at 900, 600 miles per hour. You're insulting my intelligence and coming up with stuff like that. Well, I think as a representative of BBC, you're a member of the press and you're even, uh, as I understand, you're, you're referring to many years of experience as a producer by BBC. I think that you should uh, stick to your role as what you call the, um, the fourth estate and be ready to ask questions no matter where they lead. And I'm glad you ask any questions that no matter where they lead. Okay. I'm asking you questions. No, no. I he, it, but I just but that's the point he made to me, and I wanted your response to that. Which someone who's spent their life working for for the governments, like him, and there are other members of, of of the U.S. government and the FBI, find it beyond the pale, find it um, offensive to suggest that they were spent the last nine years hunting for a person who didn't exist, that they somehow had a part in killing American citizens. Which is what you are suggesting. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm asking for an investigation. And, and on the contrary, I think that all these people fighting for their countries, including Denmark, need to see, must be presented for the hard evidence they're fighting for. I think that I am doing, the person you are referring to, a great service by asking questions. I think he deserves, actually, an investigation, doesn't he? Well, I don't think he's asking for one. So? He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't feel, feel the need. Why is he offended that, that actually the, the basic for his own work should be... But should no, it doesn't, he, to be clear, what, what he said to me is that he doesn't... Just, he doesn't he doesn't say anything wrong with you asking questions. He's quite happy for you to ask as many questions as so you want. The but it, but the, 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 the opinion that people then have, the theory that people have, which is basically you suggest there were explosives and incendiaries planted in three buildings at the, at the, at the World Trade Center to kill American people, it must have been carried out by someone. You actually don't like to suggest that it could have been carried out by the obvious implicated person that, and other people in, in, in the, in, who present alternatives will say this. Look, they say it's the US government in the shape of one. They say, oh, the distant figure of Cheney and others in a small cabal were present. Ultimately, what you're saying is the US government killed its own people. It's the other way around. It was a crime to kill 3,000 people. And I suppose that both you and I want the truth. Agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's wrong with suggesting a criminal investigation of the crime? That's your, your request. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it? Yeah. Okay. And I'm not discussing other people's feelings. And I, I'm not, I cannot relate to anybody's feeling in that connection. I'm opposed to crime. But who carried out? Who possibly could have wanted to carry out an attack like 9-11, apart from Al-Qaeda. I think this is what the investigation is all about. Give me one, one, one explanation. I don't see any. Well, give me one explanation. Why, why would you want to do it? What benefit would it have for, the, for President Bush? I'm a political scientist. Um, excuse me. I'm a natural scientist. I'm not discussing politics. So you can't see any? I am presenting, it is my duty, actually I'm an official servant, to 
bring my expertise and my knowledge to the public. And this is my duty. As it is your duty to put questions on any on any explanation which is out there. And all, I'm all, all the time talking about hard evidence. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about rumors. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm calling for an investigation of a crime. This is completely beyond the... To, to, have a, to have any crime, as you would like to call it, one of the basic aspects of any crime is to have a motive. I don't see any motive. Well, this is your problem. Yeah. Go, oh, go. is it? I, I don't see it. may be a problem with but philosophy, you, I, but if, I suppose... if you don't see a motive, I mean, it's not, it's not, the problem is not me, but I mean, in any crime, you would look for a motive. Before, you, you haven't looked for a motive? Before you investigate. Well, as you investigate, it's one of the essential points of it. If isn't it, it if, essential in any invest, criminal investigation to have a motive? If a person is killed, do you think the police is coming and asking for a motive before they start investigating? And you don't think they'd ask for a motive in their investigation? No, no but, but I, su I, su I, I suggest that you start investigating before asking for a motive. Isn't that natural? You might look for a motive during the course of investigation, but to start an investigation, 3,000 people were killed. Don't you think that should be investigated? Just because you have a limited imagination, should that refrain or prevent the police from investigating the crime? So it was investigated by the 9-11 Commission, it was invested by, investigated by NIST on several occasions over, over many years, at a cost of, of, of hundreds of millions of the dollars. The 9-11 Commission was a political commission, and it was not investigating the crime. It was only, it was, and it failed, uh, trying to make an account of what happened on the day and trying to take measures so that it should not happen again. And the 9-11 Commission report is also deeply flawed, and, uh, and uh, but this is, has been considered by other people. I know you have met with David Ray Griffin, and he is the expert on that. Now, regarding the NIST report, I have all, which addresses the technical aspects, and this is where I come in because I have read it, I would not hesitate to call scientific fraud as a cover-up. I understand on that. But you can't see any motive, you can't see, you won't, you don't, you can't, you can't see any motive to do this. Do well, this I, this you horrific don't crime. To start. To kill 3,000 people, it's a pretty serious allegation, but you can't see a motive. To start, to start a criminal investigation, you don't have to, to have a motive before you start. Agree on that? It's, uh, every criminal investigator I've ever seen, it, it looks to a motive. Yeah. I mean, shouldn't you be, as an investigator yourself, look, no. looking for a motive? No, well, I will not be investigating. I would. I look for a motive, I don't see one. Please, but you're not in the FBI. No, I'm not in the FBI. So let's leave it to the police. No, but I, I'm uh, asking questions. I ask questions. It's a straightforward question. It's a straightforward, and I thought it's a straightforward answer, but you don't see, an, you don't see any motive. But your only reference is your own lack of imagination. Okay, give me, give me an example of any possible motive for it. No, 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 no. I'm just saying that the facts are the hard evidence are that 3,000 people were killed. And I'm opposed to crime, and I just suggest that we have a criminal investigation. Well, I say the, the, the obligation is on your part, actually. The other way around is that the official explanation is, is fairly clear. Um, it's very clear, indeed. Um, that there's all the people I've ever spoken to in terms of eyewitnesses there, and actual evidence when I've seen things, points to, to backs up the official account. But the point... But, but, but for the, and you have to prove that there's not only something could have carried out, but you have to show why it would be carried out. That's, that's absolutely basic. You have to try and persuade people, but you're not willing to engage in that for some strange reason. I don't know why. Maybe because, it, because it's fanciful, if you suggest it. <laughs> I'm waiting. Because it might seem absurd. Is that the worry? Well, if you have problems with your own imagination, I think this is not... I have plenty of imagination, but it might. But I don't want to get drift into the realms of absurdity. Of course. So do you accept it's absurd I think to come it's, up with a motive? Uh, I think it's absurd, as I just told you before, that the whole scenery, including the 19 hijackers going into the four airliners, 
for which there is absolutely no evidence should be taken from the top. They have, they have actually they outfoxed FBI, CIA, sixteen intelligence agencies. They got past the ticket control. There are no tickets. They're not on the original flight manifest. There are no boarding passes. There are no ground hostesses seeing them boarding the planes. There are no video evidence for them going on board the plane. They're taking over four airliners within, I think, half an hour. They are overcoming eight very mature, strong airline pilots four of them with military backgrounds, and none of these eight airlines pilots can just slip the hijack switch when they're overcome by these young men. And they are, act they are slamming two of them into the Twin Towers at a rate of 960 kilometers per hour. This is like threading a needle on a horseback. You, can't, you just cannot do that. And as I told you about Pentagon, that you have a, a pilot, we're talking about the official account now, and what you are ready to believe. You're ready to believe that a person who could not rent a Cessna uh, flew a Boeing 757. He had never been in the cockpit before. And he could make a maneuver one hit where he's going around 290 degrees and diving at the same time several kilometers and slamming it into the best protected and supervised surveyed building in the world after having been flying around in the airspace for one and a half hour, slamming it into the Pentagon. And this is what you believe. And you are That's talking about this. this is what you believe, and you are talking about imagination. I didn't say that, no, so I'm just asking a simple question. If, what possible motive? This was no, if, no, what if, possible motive is there that for planting explosives and incendiaries in the World Trade Center? I'm not calling for. I'm. I'm not dealing with motives. I'm dealing with hard evidence, and I promise you, there is no way that the three high rises. Okay, could come down due to the impact of the two airliners. It's against basic laws of physics and it's against all the observations. And you don't have a single explanation as to why it might, it might want to do it, which is strange, but uh, there we are. So Neil, Neil, how many samples did your paper look at? The work in, in the paper is based on five samples. And um, but due to this chain of custody, which I found ridiculous actually to document during the writing up of the paper, uh, the other guys, some of the other authors, was very meticulous wanted to have this chain of custody in place, which meaning that each individual who provided the samples had to fill out a form, and they were interviewed on camera. Uh, where and how they found it. I think, why would, should anybody uh, question the authenticity of the, of the samples? I have published more than 60 papers, never in my lifetime have I run into a situation like this where somebody eventually would accuse us of forcing fire and spiking the, the samples. I just couldn't imagine. But the other guys uh, insisted on this. Now, the fifth of these of, this, of these uh, uh, five samples. The fifth poem did not want it to, uh, uh, to stand up publicly and sign these four. So all results from this fifth sample were pulled out of the final publication. So it's based on four samples, four samples in the end. Right. And where were those found? Yeah, you can see here. Yeah. No, I don't want to. Sorry, you have to assume that you're talking to a wider audience. They can't. I'm not going to tell people to refer to. It's documents. very easy because this is this is the south of Manhattan. Yeah. And you can see where the samples are found. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So they're all found in the south of Manhattan, yeah. around the site, yeah. okay. in various number of days or weeks afterwards. No, no. Actually, the the, the youngest one was, I think, uh, about 20 minutes uh, after the collapse of the North Tower, actually before the, 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 the Building 7, the third tower collapsed. And uh, the two next was the next day, and the fourth was uh, from Janet McKinley's apartment, and she came back to that apartment a week after the collapse, but she lived very close to the South Tower. 
which is important for the quality, you know, actually of, of the samples. And how did they scoop up the, the dust they found? They saved it in a plastic bag. It's all in the paper. I mean, you can just, and you don't have to be a scientist to believe that. But it was done, you, you're happy with the way it was collected? The oh yeah, yeah, of course, otherwise we wouldn't, we wouldn't consider the samples. We have had other samples which have been collected, would you say, less, with less scrutiny and uh, we don't look at them, we, don't, we take a look at them. They have to be collected and stored coolly and properly. Okay. So take me through briefly the research you did and your and the conclusions you made from it. Well, we're talking about the findings on some tiny chips. We call them chips. These are flakes. And we call them red gray chips because they're red on one side and they're gray on the other side. It's the red side which is interesting because uh, it shows all the signs of being a thematic material. I'm sorry I have to use some technical terms here because this is inevitable and I also have to be correct. Now thermite, would you let me explain what thermite is? Okay, it is actually an old discovery. It goes back to 1996. The German chemist Hans Goldschmidt... 1896, you mean? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's it's okay. what, what, what is thermite? Well, thermite is, is an old uh, discovery. It goes back to 1896, when the German chemist called Hans Goldschmidt discovered that um, a mixture of very finely divided aluminum and finely divided iron oxide, which is rust, uh, when ignited, burns at 2,500 degrees centigrade, which is very, very hot. Actually, it, and it is roughly 1,000 degrees above the melting point of iron, and molten iron is produced in the thermitic process. It's very useful, it can be used for welding, was patented in, 19, in 1898 and used in 1899 for welding tram rails in Essen in Germany. But, it is, but because the iron produced in the process is so overwhelmingly hot, it can always also be used to destruct other items, typically armor. So for that reason, the thermite reaction has been used for military purposes for a long, long time. Now what we found... What did the military use it for, exactly? Well, like torpedoes and, and grenades. Actually, not so long ago, there was a, 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 an, an event in Korea where, according to the official story, a torpedo was... Uh, the South Korean vessel was torpedoed by a North Korean vessel. And one of the, as I understand, one of the proofs for this had happened was that the South Korean in the wreckage had found aluminum oxide, which is the other product of the thermite reaction. So this is just one example. Um, but the findings uh, we have found is, is a modern version of the same, basically the same chemical reaction. The thermite reaction is not a specific reaction, actually it's a whole, it's a whole family of reactions. But um, in this case, this material that we have found is a modern high-tech version of which is exploiting the same chemical reaction. And most, the, the most person pertinent and obvious discovery we found is that the chips are reacting. They still react. We also found something, some of them which have reacted partly and where you can actually see the iron being produced in the process. And this is uh, complete, this is unambitious proof that these machines, they're very, very small. We're talking about millimeters and, and less. So you need a microscope actually to find them in the dust and some experience and some skill to find them out. But uh, so, so the research has been difficult because the sample symbol are so small. But there are techniques in electron microscopy where you can investigate this and you can and you can monitor the reaction itself. What were the main techniques you used to look at those red, red chips? Well first you have descriptive 
you're, de you're describing the material, basically optical microscopy, electron microscopy, and the various techniques which are used there. And also, as I told you, that the, the, the most important observation is the reactivity. When you heat the chips up, they take off, they react. I will not call them explosion, we do not know. But they react violently and show all the characteristics of a thermite reaction. And, uh, so, and this is done in an apparatus, which, which is called a differential scanning calorimeter. And um, beyond that, uh, what else uh, can I... I think it covers the whole family. Of and, your, and at the end of that, what was your conclusion about what those chips were? A, a scientific work, a scientific paper is a set of data, a discussion of the data, and the best hypothesis you can come up with. And based on the data and the discussion, the hypothesis that we have come up with is that this is unreacted uh, thermitic material, and it has not been challenged. The basic, the basic conclusion has not been challenged over the last two years since it came out. I mean, you gave an explanation of what thermite is. People question they, thermite is, a, is an incendiary, isn't it? Not an explosive. That's that's correct. Yeah, and you have to distinguish between explosives and incendiaries. And to, and I claim that the controlled demolitions of the three high rises were, and both incendiaries and explosives were used out of necessity, based on your observations. So it could, they couldn't have been brought down just by the thermite? No, because you see, you just watch, use your eyes and be ready to see what you actually see. Regarding the towers, for instance, what you're seeing there, you're seeing steel beams and girders being thrown up and hurled away 100, 200 meters. And we are talking about fragments of tons. Four, ten, fifteen tons being thrown 100 meters away like a spike going into the building on the other side of the street. And this means that in some energy is involved. You can see the explosions actually running in front of the crush zone as the top, as we're talking about the Twin Towers now, how they, they are being, they're being blown up from the top down. You can actually see the squips running in front of the crush zone all the way down. Some people think that the towers came down uh, by what, what you call the pile driver theory. So the, so the top actually crushed its way down through the tower. Like if you dropped a hammer on a plate, it would it, that dynamic yeah, load. Yeah, but for once, there is no top section. Just look at the video. There is no top section. Uh, also, were, were you looking at Twin Towers or the, you're talking about Building 7 there? No, no, I'm, no, no. We're talking about the towers now. Yeah. And we can come back to Building 7 in a There's second. no top section. I don't understand that, sorry. If you watch, I can show you the, the video, so we, uh, I suggest you put the video in, like the North Tower, when it collapses, there just ain't no top section. And if you take the South Tower, take the, 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 the clip taken, the video taken from a helicopter mm -hmm. to the South, mm -hmm. you can see for once mm -hmm. the explosions, you can see the explosions occurring in the top section above the impact point of the airliner. You can see this top section starts tilting of the south tower. It starts tilting. Now, if something starts tilting, it would continue and actually fall to the ground in one piece. It doesn't. It disappears in open air. There is, there ain't no, and this is only observations. If you make calculations on the energy, the energy for the pile driver theory just isn't there. I can give you the numbers. I have in my head, but if you, if you care, how much energy is available, the potential energy, and it just isn't there. Okay. Stick with your Building seven. Okay. Yeah. What are the indication of explosives and incendiaries? What you see, building seven is coming down in perfectly free fall for more than two seconds from the start, when the start. This is only possible when if a whole series of charges have fired with a very exaccurate time sequence and taking out eventually the last uh, supporting structure of the building. When the 47th story 
starts to move. There is nothing supporting it as it is going down like this. Imagine, this is, can only be accomplished. And it is the whole building, it's the whole building going down like that. There are 24 core columns. There are 57 perimeter columns all the way down. At that moment, nothing is supporting the, the 47th floor. And it comes down completely symmetrically. There is absolutely no way this could have happened. Or it couldn't support the dynamic load above it. Pardon? Or it couldn't support the dynamic load there's, above there's it. There's no, there's no load above there's it. There's no load above it. There's no floors above it? No. Well, clearly there are. Uh, we're talking about seven. Yes, I'm talking about seven. The 47th floor was the top floor. Mm -hmm. There are no, there are no the, floors okay. above the no, top no floor. floors above the, 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 just the penthouse. No, of course. But, but on the lower floors, there are clearly and clearly as dynamic load working on those that... Yeah, but the 47th down. floor, there is nothing supporting it. All the supporting structure is gone at that time. Mm -hmm. There is no way... You, you see an lie. internal collapse at the top where the pentagons... Uh, when the, when the, sorry, when the, you see an internal collapse at the top where the penthouse starts to move down and there's an... In, internal so crack and you see it you see that you see a crack with it and it goes down yes. from inside yes i'm not claiming that the whole structure so the structure no, no. could have been weakened and it, and it could just be collapsed of course of course i'm not claiming i'm not claiming that the whole structure of course not that the whole structure is taken out like that yeah. what i'm saying is the last supporting structure is taken out like that I'm saying that at the moment, uh, the seismic track is 18 seconds long. At the moment when the top floor starts moving, there is nothing supporting it. And the whole building is moving symmetrically. It's going all the way down. And Building 7 was not hit by an airliner. Now, come on. Okay. Yeah, I, want to, I want to go back to your reception a sec, but let me just think as you raise that question, I want to sort of carry on with that. I mean, um, do you know of any controlled demolition that's ever been, that, where someone's used thermite no. as part of that? No. Was that surprising? No. Well, it could be. <laughs> it's not, I'm a scientist, listen, and, and, and uh, I'm reporting hard evidence. Why? And, and I'm asking honest. Uh, I'm answering your questions honestly. Yeah. So I don't know. Why, why would you, why would someone want to use thermite as well as as a conventional explosive? Wouldn't com a conventional ask explosive them, be enough? Ask. Go and ask them. You're an uh, investigative investigative reporter. Go and ask them. Mm -hmm. They know. Who's they? Who brought down the, the, the World Trade Center? And who would that be? I don't know. You haven't really given me a suggestion oh, they who are, that might be. They are brilliant engineers. This is a masterpiece. But who's they? I, you find out. And we, we must have an investigation. I can't see a motive and I can't see a, I can't see a, 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 a person who would want That's to carry it out. You have a problem. Well, I think you have as well, because you, can't, you don't seem to be able to give me a suggestion of who, who might want to carry out and who might have done it. Your problem will be solved when we get an investigation okay. and the grand jury will find out. Okay. But you haven't got anyone in mind? Right, okay. No. Okay. Okay, so um, when you looked at the, the dust samples you had, the four dust samples, hmm. um, how much aluminium did you find? How much? What do you mean? Did you do a, a quantitative analysis of how much analysis? But this, this is all actually, oh, I don't remember the numbers, but this is already, already in the investigating done, done by the RGLE group. No, in yours, in your dust, the dust that you did. But the quantitative context of aluminum is, but the, the, actually the numbers are irrelevant because, you know, we're taking out the chips, we're not considering the dust as a whole. You're, you're being selective and looking at those particular chips. Of course. And, but you didn't do, then on those chips, or in the dust, you didn't do any quantitative analysis? No, because it's already, and this is what started the thing, it's just the, the original report from the RJLE group, already in 2003 and 2004. And the United States Geological Survey came out in 2005, and they have a complete mapping. Of, of, of the World Trade Center dust, including 
and this is quite an extensive investigation, including the total aluminum content. And this is what started Professor Stephen Jones actually and triggered him to look into the dust. Also because in particular in, in the, this is another finding which is very important. In, in, in the RJ Lee group from 2003, they reported the content of, of, of 5.87% iron spheres. These are small particles of iron which are completely round. Uh, they shouldn't be there. Iron or not iron oxide, pure iron. Iron. Yeah. Well, there's aluminum in all as well mm. because of its, the history of its formation, mm. because it comes out in a, in a, in a, in a reaction, a thermite reaction. Mm. But the findings of these spheres on their own mm -hmm. is the complete unambitious proof the thermite was also also applied during the demolition of the World Trade Center. And, and this is from 2003. You so did a sort of, you looked at, you did an analysis, looked at how much heat was released by, when you heated the aluminium, the iron oxide and mm -hmm. the red chips, yeah. how much heat yeah. was released by them? Oh, it differs from chip to chip. This comes in... in you in, think you, in, gave, in you joules, gave a range, didn't you? In joules per, per yes. gram. I yes. Think. Do you want me to... Yes, please. Yeah. It differs, actually. Kilojoules per... Per gram, mm -hmm. and uh, well, the best one comes out at eight kilojoules per gram, as far as I see. So it's one point five to seven point five, I thought. Excuse me. One point five to seven point five, I thought it was a range you had. Kilojoules yeah, per yeah, gram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you know. Okay. Very good. Is that right? Yeah. It is, according to this, it's the same as this. Okay. And did you look at any alternatives? Apart from thermite as being the cause for the red grape chip, yeah, we can't we can't find, come up with any. That is that is. Do you look at any? Do you look for any? Yeah, we, of course. As a scientist, do you look to see if there's any of course, of course. Okay. We try to come up with the best hypothesis, and it is all in the, what we call the scientific method. What else do you look at then? What other alternatives do you look well, at? Well, since I don't have any, because you don't have any. No. no, what do you, what do you suggest? You didn't have any old... Oh, of... like the paint, the primer paint. Oh, yes, sure, of course. But at that time, we did not have... Uh, we did not have actual samples of the primer paint. We have that... Uh, we have achieved that later on. And it's in my office, actually, at the university. But at that time, we, we, what we had was a description of the primer paint, which is provided... It's in the NIST report. And, uh, and there's a whole chapter actually on the primer paint because you, um, you can use the primer paint as, as uh, an indication of the thermal history of the steel beams. And it's very, it's, an, it's very interesting on its own because when you, you, the steel beams were covered by protective paint and when you heat it up, it starts cracking. It's called mud cracking because it looks like cracked mud. And, and from the cracks, you can actually determine the temperature, of the, the thermal history of the beam. And NIST did not find any steel beams from the core of, of the towers, which has been exposed to beyond 250 degrees centigrade. In the, from the in, the, paint. Uh, and it's in the twin towers you're talking about? Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. And it's the same number, actually, from seven. In spite of, you know, most of the steel was actually, you know, hurried away, which is forbidden to remove any evidence from a crime scene. But what the remains that NIST had for observation, none of them, according to the primer paint, had been beyond 250 degrees centigrade. Now this primer paint is, is described, and its thermal stability is also described, because NIST, or company, it's a private company, did experiments with the beams and heated them up and see what happens up to 800 degrees. And what happened is that this mud cracking when you heat up the primer paint and around 600 degrees it starts peeling off and the, the polymer matrix starts charring and actually this charring is more or less complete around 800 degrees. Now the point here is that the primer paint is stable. That's one thing. Another thing is the content of the primer paint. And I've actually done these calculations myself. 
uh, is that the primer paint contains up to 30%, I have to be a little technical here, of zinc chromate, uh, which is the protective agent of the primer paint. And um, we do not see that. And later on, we have achieved actual standards. It's not so easy, but we have got some samples of the primer paint, and they behave completely as expected. I have made experiments with it myself. When, when you say the primer paint, you, 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 you're basing on the, you've looked at one primer paint from the World Trade Center, is that right? What do you mean? I'm asking you how many examples of primer paint from the World well, Trade Center. According, according to the NIST report, there is only one. Right. You think there's only one used? At and the, and the, the samples Center, that so. we have received uh, uh, matches the NIST description. Mm -hmm. so what, else, what more can I say? Your paper, was it published in a leading journal and peer reviewed? No, it was published in what we call it, 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 an open open journal. Mm -hmm. And peer reviewed in that? Oh, yeah. Okay. And what was being the reaction by other scientists? Have you been challenged ah. at all? Zero. No, a challenge, no, not really on the. Um, your, some chance on the mythology, uh, people have asked, well, why haven't you done this, why haven't you done that? And this is, you can always say that. But what's been the reaction of scientists to your conclusions? No. No. It is beyond doubt the best peer review paper ever in my career. I would like to know how many times it has been downloaded, how many people have actually read it. Nobody has challenged your conclusions. You can always challenge the details of, of the, how the data were made. And this is fair enough. But when it comes down to it now, if, if, you, if you don't believe this, you don't believe that. So what, what is it? What is the red grey chips? Nobody has come up with a better hypothesis than ours. Okay. I went to speak to Professor Richard Fruhan. He's a professor of metallurgical engineering at the Carnegie Mellon University with 50 years of experience in the field, associate editor of the leading journal, Metallurgical and Materials Transactions Journal, which is peer reviewed. And he says he's never heard of the journal you published in until I mentioned it to him. And he, he said himself, when he looked and read your report, um, your paper, he said he would never have published it, your article in his journal. So what? What's the problem? I, okay. Someone who understands it, someone who's a metallurgical expert, no, yeah. um, says that he wouldn't publish it. He says that you made fundamental mistakes in your, in your research. Or he should publish that, if we have made any fundamental uh, mistakes. But I, maybe I should rather refer to the fact that you're, you're taking in a person who say, I will not publish this. You must understand what has happened to academia in general since 9-11 because it is a very, very bad career move to bring up 9-11 at all, to talk about it at the lunch table. And, and this journal we're talking about here, actually, my dean was at the external advisory board, he, and his name is Anderson, so he was actually number one on the list. This was one of the four reasons for, for, using, for publishing in this paper. And... Um, it's not a well-known paper, though, is it? A well-known journal? No, but it has benefits, uh, which I'm ready to explain. And one of them is... It doesn't go on an abstract service, does it, to other scientists? I don't know. No, it doesn't. Okay. Well, so what? But the leading journals would. Yeah. They would get a more rigorous peer yeah. review. Yeah, but there are three reasons why a leading, the leading journal would not accept it uh, for several reasons. One of them is that it is very long. And in a journal which has, um, which has a printed version, you would never be allowed to put in 33 column pictures. But most importantly to us is that it's an open journal. And you must understand that it is always the scientists who pay for the publication. No matter which kind of, of journal you're talking about, it's always the scientists paying because there's the same people reading as there's the same people publishing. So if you, if you pay for the journal by subscription, it's basically the same thing as if you pay what we call a page charge. And sometimes you pay both, actually. You both pay for the subscription and you pay for the printing. There's always a scientist paying. But this concept, which is a little new, they tried to break the monopoly of the old journals. 
which had which has pushed the subscription rates into uh, into what you would say uh, very high high levels and beyond reach of ordinary people. If you want to read a paper from one of the old conventional journals, you have either to be, have be affiliated an institution or go to the library. It's beyond reach for any single individual to subscribe to this because they're simply too expensive. Now, this new concept, which was endorsed by my dean, uh, relies on a different mechanism because it's free. So point one, it's everyone can download it and we wanted this to happen. Point two, it would never come out, have a, have a printed version because there are too many illustrations. Point three, we kept the copyrights of all the pictures. We still have the copyrights. If you want to show a picture from this, you have, would have to ask me because I have the copyrights. But if it had one of the other journals, you would have to ask the journal. So these are very good reasons for using this one. Are you, another person I spoke to there at uh, the Carnegie Mellon University, Professor Christopher Pistorius, um, he says that nobody has bothered to t take the time to, to look at this. Uh, it doesn't mean to say it's right, it just means it hasn't been proven wrong. And he said, there are lots of reasons why nobody would take the time. It's frankly irrelevant. It would be fairly easy to rebut, but every, everybody has got more interesting things to do. Okay, why are we sitting here? The reasons they suggested that it was uh, they had problems with your paper is, first of all, um, they said uh, 20 years ago analysis like yours was done on a few particles and now they do look at thousands um, and within that they would do hundreds of analyses and that's the sort of work that RJ Lee or US, the US Geological Survey would do. They do, and they would do a quantitative analysis as they go. Um, you based on taking full samples and then specifically looking out for certain things. They suggest that's not the way science in this way now works. Bring us the samples. NIST won't give us any. No, they're saying the way you conducted your own survey of the material, even the samples, take it as read that you, the samples even are, are, are correct and they've been corrected in the, in the right way. They would challenge that, they would suggest that they weren't, that there is, they aren't. But however, take it that you've got samples there. The way you've analysed it, they're saying, is wrong. It's an outdated way of looking at it. It's being selective. Well, do they accept the And they don't do as many, and you don't do, it's selective and you don't do as many calculations as, as as others would do. Do they accept the data? They, they look at it and suggest that there are plenty of other good reasons as to what it might be. Wonderful. Why don't they, why don't they present them? Well, they say the most likely source of aluminium um, in, the, in the red chips is paint. Specialised, cured paint. Why don't they... So you, so you think that the... Why don't they come up with their, with their suggestion then and publish it? And do you think that... Well, they've done an interview with me and they said it's specialised cured paint. So why, so why didn't you ask them the reason for putting paint on the World Trade Center, which it actually contradicts what was there, but which okay, was... I'll give you which Professor is, Christopher Pristorius, who's an expert in this type of paint. You should go okay. and that. Yeah. He said there was this type of paint was in use at the World Trade Center. Which, he also it? suggests that uh, there were lots of different types of paint of, of this type of primer paint being used, not just one because it, there's lots of different types, and so you you might have got one sample, but there are lots of others. The, mm -hmm. the type that oh, includes... Oh, okay. May I come in? Yeah, okay, come in. Because on, okay. There, are, there are paint in the dust. There are paint samples in the dust, but they don't react. There's lots so, of different compositions of paint is what he's making. It's, 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 it's contradicting it's, the NIST report. But it, I, he, why don't he publish this? If he claims this, he's, he's in contradiction with the NIST report. He's in contradiction with our findings. We have published it. You don't think there were lots of different types of paint being used? At, Not at the according to the NIST report. As it, tell us about it. Come well, out. it's listed in the buildings. You could actually You're go back and look at the, <laughs> the buildings. The My, type of... My okay. Sorry. Sorry. okay. I mean, I, didn't quite, I don't think you quite answered this question. Uh, uh, I would just ask you again. Is, is What they were saying is that rather than taking a few few particles and doing analysis on that, 
they suggested that the modern technique is to take do much larger quantitative analysis and do many more many more samples um, and many more analysis within those samples. Yeah. Weren't you being selective? Pardon? Weren't you being selective? Yeah, we are selecting the red red chips from the dust, of course. Trying to find something out rather than being objective. Uh, what should we? You had a conclusion in mind when you. No, you did. Yeah. Please. A scientific work and a scientific paper is a set of data mm -hmm. and a discussion and the best hypothesis of the day. And that's what it is. That's what they suggested. And if they're asking for more... And Professor Fruhan, let me give you what Professor Fruhan yeah. said yeah. to me. He said, if you show me a pile of dust, I could find almost anything in there, but maybe not in a large quantity. You should do more of a quantitative analysis when you look at essentially a thousand such particles, analyze those with XRD to get a true analysis of what the material is. You could always find something in a pile of dust and that proves your point. But it would be extremely small and could be a lot of other explanations for it as well. Yes. Same thing. So well, why don't you present the other explanations mm -hmm. and publish it, please? I mean, you're, you're reading for a piece of paper. It really doesn't count. The only thing which counts in science are, are published data. Contrary views don't count. Remember, he has to stand up what is missing, basically, or generally, in all this whole discussion about the science thing and the demolition of the towers is a discussion in a, in a, a gathering, in a room of peers. And I have tried repeatedly here locally in Denmark and the technical university to ask for a symposium or a hearing, whatever you call it, where actually people can discuss this in plenum, in a group. Where the but here's someone are. giving you a specific explanation and, dis and, and challenging what the methods you've used and the conclusions you've yeah. reached, and you dismiss it for another reason. No, no, because no. this time, you know, I like uh, you dismiss the witness at the, at the, at the Pentagon or the witness at the World Trade Center. This one's dismissed because he doesn't, because he, he hasn't published it. I shrug my shoulders <laughs> because he's not saying anything. Basically, yeah. maybe we should ponder that. He's not saying anything. He's asking for more. So what? I'm asking, does he, does he recognize the data? Does he accept the data? Did you ask him that question? You asked him. He looked through your paper. In and detail. did he accept the data? He, he looked through it and saw that there was an alternative explanation for it. So, and what was that? He, he, they suggest, the two of them suggest, that it was specialized cured paint. The type of paint that's used, actually specified and used at the moment on the Manhattan Bridge. Oh, did you know that? Please, why don't, doesn't he publish that? It's a primer coat used and specified by the New York Department of Transport. Did you know that? No. Widely used in New York. Pardon? It's widely used in New York. Did you know that? So did you have, did you suggest that you have a paint which actually reacts at 430 degrees and produces iron in the process? Is that what you're suggesting? But if you heat it, then yeah. it, 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 it gives off, eventually it will give off some heat, yes. And it means that if in a, in a fire, it would not be, it would be very, a, the quite opposite of fireproof. Why do, why do people use things like micaceous iron oxide with polymers and, and, and aluminium flake? Why do you think they use that? Does it have a purpose? Why, why do you think they use those aluminium flakes and micaceous iron oxide? Excuse me. Why do they use those specialized primer plates? Do you know why they're being used? You think that you don't know why they're being used? I think what you're suggesting is is, is the application of a paint which is a semi-explosive. It's being used by the New York Department of Transport right. at the moment. Okay. Why don't you? Why do you think they use it? Well, I, to prepare for future attacks in New York? Are you suggesting or prepare for future? Attacks? Is that what you're suggesting? I mean, no, it's no, being used at the moment on actual buildings at the moment. I'm not. It's the exact type of paint with aluminium in it. So what, what, but you don't seem to understand why, why they use it. It's used for, I'll explain, I mean, it's used for, it is used for, for, for its, to stop corrosion. It's meant to, it's a primer barrier to stop water getting into, into, to iron steel work. That's why it is. I, I thought you might have known things, you might have looked at the alternatives, but you don't. We're looking for the primer okay. paint. It's fine, it's fine. Okay, you don't. Hey, 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 hey. Okay. We have looked at the primer paint applied. Yeah. In You've looked at one. 
Prima Paint. No, we looked at the NIST report, yeah. which made an account for the Prima Paint. Right. Okay. You looked so at that's one thing. thing. Yeah. And we have obtained authentic samples of the Prima Paint from the steel beams. And they perfectly, what do you say, fit the description in the NIST report. And that is the basis of our conclusions, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. And, and Professor Christopher Pistorius speaks very clearly that on an on a, on a area like the World Trade Center, the num the num there would have been a whole series of different primer paints used, why not just one. So why is it not in the NIST report and why doesn't he come up with it? Mm -hmm. Well, he did come up to me, he did explain it to me. If you uh, heat a cured paint with polymer iron oxide aluminium, like the one we're talking about, heat will be released, yes? The polymer will burn, the aluminium will react with iron oxide, and the heat released by it, according to your paper, is around about 1.5 to 7.5 kilojoules per gram. That's the scientific calculation mm -hmm. for it. How does that amount, what does that compare to, to a typical office fire? What do you think is the amount of heat being released by that in the same? I have no idea. Don't you? Actually, the burning of coal. Actually. No, no, just take an office fire. Quite important to say, because you're saying it's got some special characteristics, this. Yeah, but the point here is... Not that's the question. How much, in comparison to an office fire, is being released in terms of energy? The same calculation. I, have, I, I don't know, actually, but I, I probably you'll get more out of the office fire, because when coal burns... Yes, it's twice as much as yeah, the yeah. most... So it's 15 yeah. kilojoules per gram. Yeah. That's twice as much yeah, as yeah. from your supposedly dangerous compounds. No, no, you haven't understood. Because I've understood perfectly. And there's more energy being released out of an office fire I'm sorry, than I there is out of this supposedly highly dangerous material. I have to then entertain you a little bit about basic chemistry. Because what you are referring to is the combustion of carbon, basically. Furniture, trees, wood, okay? In air. Mm -hmm. So there are two components in that reaction. And that is the carbon in the wood and the air. Mm. So, and it is a very slow reaction. It's true that more, that more energy is released, but it's very slow. So over the time, probably, uh, actually, it's true, more energy is comparable, twice as much is comparable. It is more energy is released when you burn carbon, but it's what we call a diffuse fire. It's burning from the surface. So you can never reach temperatures at 1538 degrees centigrade, which is the melting point of iron. Do you, have, do you have a stove? Have you ever seen a stove? Have you ever seen it melt when you put in wood in the stove? Have you ever seen that? No, of course not. You cannot melt iron in ordinary office fire. You are at least eventually thousand degrees below the melting point of iron. So come on. You are referring apples and oranges. It's an inconvenient fact for you. It yeah, but it's, more. I but mean, in fact, NIST actually says that typical, the office station, substation they looked at produces 17 to 20 kilojoules per gram. Yeah, but you would that's, never... That's, that's nearly three times as much as, is... as energy is being released by your supposedly highly energetic material. Time is an issue. And the point is the temperature you reach within time. Mm. The thermite reaction brings its own reactants and it reacts very fast. So that's why you get a temperature of 2,500 degrees centigrade. Now an office fire, if you, unless you blow in oxygen, you never get, you don't get beyond say 700 degrees centigrade. You are roughly eight to nine hundred degrees below the melting point of iron. So your point is irrelevant. Is that point? Your point is irrelevant. Mm. Yeah, but there are many irrelevant points in the NIST report. Well, they don't think it is. They're, they're, they're experts in metallurgy, world experts in metallurgy. They don't think it is <laughs> very relevant. But I guess you will dismiss them because, Trust they, yourself. because, they, because they say something contrary to you. Um, the temperature at which it started to react was what, when these red grey chips were temperature? 430. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. And what would you expect it if it was thermite? Oh, actually, there's no... Um, it's very hard to find ignition temperatures on thermite. But it wouldn't be that, would it? It wouldn't be 430. No, as a conventional thermite is very... Is a, you know, it can be ignited all time. Hans Goldschmidt, all time thermite. 
can be ignited by various means and it's, it's very difficult to find well-defined ignition temperatures. Um, but it wouldn't be 430 degrees. De definitely not. It's much higher. Right. But the point here is, what I believe, and we also said that the, 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 the polymer matrix helps along for the relatively low, and actually it's burning, so it's, it helps along to the low ignition temperature. Yeah. But it's characteristic for nanothermite. Yeah. You know, it has been produced. We have made nanothermite ourselves independently, following the, the recipes from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And it takes off at these low temperatures. And guess what? If you burn the paint that they're talking about, the primer paint they look at, it would burn out exactly around about 430, no. 450 no, no. degrees centigrade. No, no. Well, Professor Chris. Christopher Pistorius oh. from Carnegie Mellon says it would. Yeah, but I have made experiments with primer paint from the tiles. Mm. And I You've made experiments on what? As a, a few, but, but I have but I have made experiments on the on authentic primer paint from the tiles. I heated it up and I promise you nothing happens until eight hundred degrees and what you have left is black tar. Combustion. Okay. So there you have two of the world's leading experts in metallurgy produce A questioning the methods you've used and B suggesting a completely harmless but much more plausible and more likely um reason for, for the red grey chips and what and the characteristics within them. Um, why don't you accept what they say? Because I want to meet them face to face and I want them to publish this. I don't take your report for it. you as uh, in going between here. Maybe you made this up on your way down here. I made it up? Yeah, it could be. How do I know? I want to meet them. I want them to publish and come out in the public domain and say what they're saying, provide their evidence. Why don't they provide their evidence? I'm talking about evidence all the time. But they've done an interview with me. I don't think, do you think that I made that up? Or? No, no, no. It seems to suggest they did No, I'm just saying that I'm, of course, ready. Why don't they invite me or any of the other authors to their university and let us, each of us, give a presentation. Because they say it's irrelevant. They, they say, say it's, not it's, worth, a... it's not worth further study. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't have published your journal, your paper in their journal. They just they don't think it's a, the right standard. That's okay. why. That's a very personal thing, isn't it? Well, it's not. It's, 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 a, it's a question. It's, you're a scientist. You're saying it's got the, the right standard. They say it hasn't got the right standard. Okay. If he peer reviewed it, he would have rejected it, he said, said Professor Fruhan. Okay, okay. Well, that's pretty, pretty serious, isn't it? Well, no, it is not. A professor of 50 years experience well, in metallurgy, one of the world's leading experts in exactly this field. It's not your field, is it? Your field is not metallurgy. I'm a nanoscience editor, but no, that's true. But your field is not metallurgy, is it? Why doesn't your professor... Is it? Is it your field metallurgy? No. He is. Okay. He's got 50 years experience, but yet again, you say that either I made it up or that for some, for some other reason you would suggest you don't want to listen to a, a leading expert in the field. Of course. Of course I will. This is absurd. But why, where is he? I'm not listening to him. I just quoted exact quotes of what he said. Very good. So let him come out in the public domain. It's never, the standard's never quite good enough for you, is it? Um, when, when someone has something that's contradictory, it's never quite good enough for you, is I'm, it? But he hasn't presented himself to me. You're a go-between between him and I. Okay, him and me. Okay. So I suggest that your professor publish and defend the statement in the public domain. Why is well, he? has put it in the public domain. He's just done an interview with BBC, isn't he? Why yeah. is he? Pretty hiding? clearly in the public domain, isn't it? Why is he hiding? I think he's hiding anything. And he's saying that it is not worth written. But well, he wouldn't have published it. He just said, you know, I asked him a question, would you have published it in your journal? He said, no, I wouldn't. If I peer-reviewed it, I would have rejected it. Okay. Because it wasn't up to the correct standards of science. It's not how we do that sort of research now. It might have been 30 years ago. 
doesn't know, and he disagrees with your conclusion. He said you were being selective. What? Why? I, I still suggest that he come up with his criticism following the standard rituals or routes for doing that instead of and in, 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 instead of actually giving it in, an interview as you claim with BBC again so you suggest that I claim no, an not, interview or what? please um, let me repeat well that's what what say, you, 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 you've decided to record the interview I mean you're saying things that I don't, I don't accept I don't claim there's an interview there was an interview there was an interview and I've given you exact quotes of what someone said and, and yet again you're not willing to accept what, what someone said I haven't taken a position on that I'm saying that what is needed here is a public hearing among peers. Because when you take in any single individual, and that goes for me too, mm -hmm. in an interview, you can get any opinion you want out there. This has happened, it's true. This is something which has happened to academia, and I can explain to you why, because it's based on the funding system and the and the whole thing. But and they never heard of your paper. I asked them a question about it. They answered. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. They gave you a, a, an answer you didn't like, so you dismiss it. What is needed? It's pretty no. simple to me. No. You don't like things that seem to contradict your no. point of view. No, I'm saying let's take the decision into into a peer for a forum of peers where we can discuss things. And where somebody are presenting their opinion, because people have to, you have to bring people together in order to have a proper scientific discussion. Mm -hmm. You we sh should not discuss with any relays. That's what I'm saying. Where I what I'm calling for is a scientific symposium on 9/11 science, and this could be an issue. And I'm, I'm suggesting your professor to invite me or Professor Jones or Kevin Ryan or either one of us, preferably together, at a symposium at his institute and let's talk it over together with his colleagues. You know, I know a person who's from a completely different end of the spectrum um, who's helped found Scholars for 9-11 Truth, uh, Professor James Fetzer, says that um, he thinks... He's, he suggests that nanothermite only becomes explosive if it's combined with explosives, which is true. It's an incendiary. It only be, and, really? that is, and the same is true of toothpaste. If you combine toothpaste with an explosive, then it becomes an explosive. The inherent characteristic of, of, of thermite is an incendiary, not an explosive. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know where the red grade chips fit into the demolition picture of the um, World Trade Center. We know that incendiaries were used, and I can come up with a list of 10 other observations, which each of them unambitiously imply the application of thermite. We so how could someone have got into the World Trade Center then, and please, a, let me run, finish. Very important. Let me finish. Okay, well, that's the okay. next. And we can bring to yeah. that access okay. to the tower things right. afterwards. So, we know that incendiaries were used. They must, by necessity, have been thermitic. We also know that explosives were used simply from the cause of collapse. They could have been thermitic because modern explosives are based on these very same reactions. What is it's called composite materials. They are based on these reactions. But we do not know where the red grade chips fit in. They could probably more than one kind of thermite was applied. But then we have to talk about sulfidation of the steel. But uh, So we do not know where the red grade chips fit in. The only thing we know is that they shouldn't be there and the, it is thermitic material because iron is being formed in the process. Have you done any calculations on the size of the building and working out the size of the steel and how much thermite would you have needed to, to we, bring down that building? A lot. No. Because it's, it's quite a lot, isn't it? Actually? Yeah, tons. Tons. Yeah. And no one saw anything untoward in Building 7, no, no pre-cutting, no storing of tons of thermite, highly reactive, as you say. How do you know? How because you I've know? not found anyone. Have you found anyone who said anything, saw sort of someone carrying tons of thermite into the building, well, placing them in by girders, ripping off fireproofing? 
placing them in all the key positions that you would in a cold de controlled demolition? Again, Have you found anyone? Well, if you found anyone, would you report it in the BBC? I certainly would. Okay. But I think... Uh, Have you found anyone? No. But I, but another, th but I can tell you that the access to the towers has been very well documented by Kevin Ryan. This is one of the co-authors of this paper, and I would suggest that you read some of his essays on the way he is very. It is, it is not difficult to get into the towers, and you. The key thing here is to get access to the steel structure. But you're talking about taking in. Tons, yeah. as you accept, yeah. tons on pallets. Thermite. On pallets. No, and explosives. I, so I don't. And explosives. So yeah. Yeah. Rigging the place with explosives, yes. wiring, yes. and no one saw it. Why do you That's know? Really, it's I just know. absurd. Isn't it? How, you know, what you know is that nobody reported it. Okay, that's a different thing. Because, of course, somebody saw it. And that you don't have to, if, if you have a pallet with explosives and you're bringing them into World Trade Center, you do not write on the side explosives for demolition, would you? You would just bring them in. Professor Fetzer also suggests that the nano thermite has been oversold, he said, to the 9 11 community. It's been grossly exaggerated, and that Stephen Jones and people like yourself who work with them have been infatuated with thermite. Well, you, you might say, I would rather say that nanothermite is just one in a whole series of observations and findings. Each of them is in contradiction with the unofficial, official version of events. And that is true. That is true. I mean, the free fall and the, and the stand down of the, of the Air Force is and just to mention too, is um, just as as violating the official account. So in that sense, I agree. I would it, the nanothermite should be seen in a context along with all the other observations. The thermite was used. I mentioned, I mentioned the ion spheres. There's no way that could be explained without the ap application of thermite. Molten iron, iron was pouring out of the South Tower prior to collapse, and iron melts at 1538 degrees centigrade. Molten iron was observed in, in the rubble after the collapses. It took three months to put out the fires in the rubble. Who, who saw the molten iron in the... I have counted at, at least 23 witnesses and we have, uh, there is photographic evidence of that. Well, I spoke to one of those people who is, I spoke to several of those people who, it's, it's, it's been suggested of being evidence of that. But one is, one is the controlled demolition expert, Mark Loiseau. Another is Professor oh. Hassan Astine, who's a structural engineer at uh, Berkeley, California. Both of those have been suggested that they said it. When you actually go and speak to them, they they saw something else. They saw they 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 saw the the the, the rubble afterwards smouldering and it had been smouldering and there had been fires below the surface in in the rubble. So it hardly suggests that, that there is molten iron flowing through. And no, yeah. I've not found anyone who actually says it. Well, they you should ask you should ask NASA then. Did you ask them? Because they flew over. I've seen it. I've seen the, the temperature that happens at the high temperatures afterwards. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Seven hundred and fifty degrees. Six days after. Six days of showers. Mm -hmm. It was pouring down cats and dogs. And what's under the ground in the debris? Is that is it material that could burn? It actually kept on burning for three months. Yes, it did. Yeah. It took them officially the fires. Yeah. Is there any combustible material in the dust, in the in the debris from the World Trade Center, do you think? Any combustible material at all? Not which can keep on burning for three months. You need oxygen. You need oxygen to do that. Yeah. And there, there were eruptions of strange chemicals coming out on specific days. I have to then use some technical Eruptions? Terms. Yeah. Right. It were like volcanoes. There were chemicals coming out of the ground on very limited time of them, like explosions were going on down in the rubble, 
and we are talking about I have to name, give you some chemical names styrene, benzene, toluene and some very strange chemical called 1,3-diphenylpropane which has never been observed after mm -hmm. conventional fires. Mm -hmm. Why should it take three months to put out these fires and all the fires? Mm -hmm. Why should it take three months? Mm -hmm. Something was happening in ground zero, which is beyond the official story. One, um, the FBI special agent I spoke to said, she says the, the continued doubting of what happened is unfair to the families and friends and belittles those who lost their lives on 9-11 and obscures the real story of what happened. I don't think that the family and friends deserve to have a real investigation of what happened. She doesn't, no. She doesn't. Don't you think that it would be fair to the family and friends to have an investigation well, I'm asking of the crime? what she says. She says she felt... Yeah, but this is a very, per this is a very personal thing. It was personal to her. Somebody's I've... gathered up body parts of people who have been killed there. So you feel quite hurt by the fact that you and others continue to question whether people actually on that airline were killed there. Of course they were killed. Of course they were killed. Oh, so you only oh, seem to be suggesting the airline didn't crash at the Pentagon. Of course people were killed. Clear, but, yeah. Of course people were killed. That's right. And we are talking about that this crime was never investigated. And I, you may have your own opinion, but I think that we honour the key, the, these people who were murdered best by, by carrying out a criminal investigation and persecuting the perpetrators. Do you think by doing what you do, you take a, presumably what you're saying is, is this, it's, this is a gross crime. Do you think you're taking a personal risk yourself by, by coming up with the, doing the work you're doing? I have no way back. You can, you, if you if you fight, you might lose. But if you don't fight, you have lost. And you'll keep fighting. I have no way back. I have six grandchildren. And what is going on here, in my opinion, is our very civilization which is at stake. There is no way that our civilization can continue without facing these unsolved questions of 9 11. So I think this is very serious. I'm talking about all the things you love. I'm talking about democracy. I'm talking about welfare. I'm talking about the elderly. I'm talking about the children. I'm talking about economy. I'm talking about environment. I'm talking about the very future of our Western society and our civilization. And I'm very concerned and I think there is no way our children can expect a future like ours unless we face the unsolved questions of 9-11. Okay, cut. Cut. Okay. Do you have any children? I do. Do you have children? Yes, I do. Yeah. That's why we're here today. It. I would always look to them desperately in search of the truth of everything, every story I ever do. And I ask any question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So what do you sign? What do you, what do I sign? I sign up to the chance of the BBC's Charter and the Ofcom. What you, the, the crucial point of what you're agreeing to is that it is an editor programme. You need to understand it's an editor programme because it's a BBC Two programme yeah. and it is a programme about 9-11 and the theories about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or translate your condition and you waive and revoke any moral rights you may have in them. 
We, we have you. The point is, we have the copyright in the in the interview because we, we broadcast it because we have to be able to broadcast it to our, we give it to other people. It's a, it's a program that's made by the BBC and is sold worldwide. It goes out worldwide. Yeah. But you have so we have to have the copyright to be able to do that. That's what it says. You have your copyright of your own footage. That's what it's saying. Yes. And you don't have the copyright of our. Well, I'm not. I'm not taking that tape, am I? I'm using my tape. Yes. Okay. But maybe that should be specified. No, you don't need to specify. Well, you, you, can, you can have a note, but it's, it's clearly talking about our interview. No, it's talking about... Thank you. you, you contribute. The contribution is clearly the tape that I've got. I can't take your tape because you, you haven't given it to me or you won't give it to me. It doesn't, and it's going to be exactly the same anyway. But if you want to make that point, it's perfectly fine because it won't make any difference at all. Because it's, yeah. it's, clearly it's about talking about the interview you gave me, mm. on record. And to be clear while you're filming this as well, I wouldn't talk about anything off the record and wouldn't normally have people filming while I'm talking about things that are off the record. So that's mm. absolutely clear again. Maybe you stay in yes, however you want to. Do you want to do that first and I can... Do you want to scan that? Or, or I can fax it to you from London. Or I can give you a copy of that as it is and then I'll send you the... I'll fax you the site. I think I'll add the thing about your footage, your tape. So your contributions. Uh, you assign to the BBC the copyright uh, to and all the rights in your contributions. But is that really, is that really true that this is the footage, uh, this is the tape actually of your machine? Yes, the tape of my machine, yeah. the interview you gave why, why is it then your contributions? It's just it's using it as a phrase to describe the, what, how you've, you've um, contributed to the programme. So it's saying, and seeing as we work in the broadcast media, your contribution has to be in a broadcast medium, and that is yeah. tape. I so can't really see to any to other explanation for is it. Foot, is footage an English word? Mm -hmm. Oh, is it American? Mm -hmm. Can I write the copyright to your footage? Recorded by the BBC. You can, I can scan it and scan it and send me a PDF. Yeah, yeah okay, I'll do that.